that some of you want to know about how I got from where you are students as a student to where I am now. And so what you just heard, they were all building blocks that allowed me to go down this journey, go through this journey I've been going through. So I think that uh, there, there's several key points, and I'm going to touch on them lightly because of time, and then any you want to drill down on later, we can talk in more, more detail about it. I think one of the things I was blessed with was a mother whose sister was a surgeon. So from age as early as I can remember, hearing that Jan was going to become a surgeon uh, was really important. That being said, I lost my first patient, who was a kitten. Uh, so that's when I detoured from surgeon. <laughs> um, but that's, that's another story I won't bore you with right now. Then, then there are lessons in life you learn what you don't want to do. I bet some of you have had that. So at age 13, I was sent out to work on a tobacco farm in North Carolina and to do what's called burning tobacco. You would hang the tobacco in the barn. I learned from that I was never going to do a job I got filthy at, and I was never going to touch tobacco. <laughs> so those were two things at 13. That's a pretty big deal to pick that up early on. Um, I think also I learned from my, my mother um, that you really do only get what you work hard for. So she had the principle that I had to make enough money to pay for college, to pay for a car if I wanted one, that she would buy me contact lens and a pair of shoes a year, but everything else I had to pay for. So that started uh, years truly working in women's specialty stores and working my way up from a clerk, uh, a file person they hid in the back room because I was working illegally, I was too young, <laughs> to bringing me out to them working as a salesperson, then window designing, and then at that, at that stage some modeling and then gradually buying and then management of the store. That carried me through my master's degree. That's how I paid for college. That's how I paid for my first Mustang in 1965. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's the lesson. That was, it was a hard lesson. It was a hard lesson, especially when you're going to college with, uh, my first college was all women, and um, they were rich women. Mm -hmm. And I was there working, but I got the catbird seat because I was working as also a student hostess, so I got to read all their dates as they were coming <laughs> There's a definite advantage to that position. <laughs> uh, then I think um, one of the things from the, the um, junior and senior years in college, like you, uh, volunteer work was very important. I was a Kappa Delta, I guess I'm supposed to say I still am a Kappa Delta. Uh, and we had, it, I had already done volunteer work. I had grown up again with the core value that you always give back. So every year there was always a trip of donations to the Salvation Army and other things, a volunteer at the hospital, other things. But sorority um, required a substantive activity in the summer. So I actually founded the Tuberculosis Association office in Goldsboro, North Carolina. And I did that as a college student. So that was, again, setting that up. That was a big topic back then, students. Setting that up so that it was operational and ready to go. So that was a learning experience. In teaching high school English and, and teaching, Peter, teaching was easy. Being a K-12 counselor was, I got shot at. Uh, you know, you, you, you learn these lessons, but what I learned as a school counselor um, we had two children who were first grade and third grade who were coming to school within Patigo, and the younger one was also, he had school phobia. So the social worker and I decided we'd go out to the home to visit the mother, right? Seems reasonable, uh-huh. Got to the front door and the mother's boyfriend was standing on the front porch and fired a shotgun at us. Fortunately, it went over our heads. Well, we learned later why the kids had impetigo and school phobia. That's another long story. But I decided it might be better to go into another profession at that point. <laughs> and, uh, the high school teacher, what my students taught me, I was teaching high school senior English, and I was teaching Shakespeare, and I had a slow class right after lunch. I had an advanced class first thing in the morning, and so I was trying to consider how I could bring alive Shakespeare for the slower class. 
So I was doing some things with the faster class, and the ones after lunch had found out about it, and they said, well, why aren't you doing that with us? Mm -hmm. Hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I immediately remedied that, and they got more from that class probably than the smarter class got. But that was a, a lesson learned in that way, too. Um, when um, I've talked with you about Cheryl's major role in terms of my background, but there was another incident here that was very in instrumental. When I was at the dissertation level, uh, how many of you are at the dissertation level now? Any of you? Well, when I got there, I had a committee. Uh, it was headed by a very famous person in vocational development, uh, David Tiedemann from Harvard, who was here. And I was doing um, a front-end study on the psychological impact of televised cartoons on children. There was not research on that at that point. And David had orchestrated a career for me with Children's Television Network. Mm -hmm. So that's where I was headed. Then I leave on vacation and come back and my entire committee had left the university. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Joyce Chick was the new head of the program. And she said, well, your committee's left, so you have Nick Gimstead as your new major professor. He knows nothing about, nor do any of our faculty know anything about what you were doing. So you have to pick a new topic and start over. <laughs> so Nick, being a brand new professor, only knew paraprofessional training from a research perspective of chairing a dissertation. So that was the detour that put me into higher ed. Uh, so the study then was, a new study was started, a year-long study, looking at paraprofessional training of residence assistants at Florida State, Florida, and South Florida. But that then led to changing, it, it really made the case that was used by ACPA and ACUO to change the training for resident hall assistants. So it was a case that acknowledged, yes, they do counseling, and so you might as well train them because <coughs> that's how it has to be. So there was that, that detour. Uh, so then just in summary, kind of moving very fast through, through a number of years, um, when I was finishing my doctorate, I thought, you know, I was gonna be a counselor educator, that's what you do. And I interviewed down at FIU. FIU was opening the next year. So Chuck Perry, a 28-year-old president, was putting together his team and I went down and interviewed with Chuck, a dy dynamic guy, and he, <laughs> he offered me a position there as part of the founding administration of FIU, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting there as a very brand new, arrogant PhD saying, if this little guy, little, he's little when he's alive, <laughs> if this guy at age 28 can be a university president, I sure can too. So then I started down the road of finding out, well, how do you, what do you have to do to become a university president? And what do they do anyway? Because it looked like he was having a lot of fun. <laughs> so then I found out you've got to be a full professor with tenure, you've got to be a dean, a department chair, you've got to be a provost, you've got to do all these things. I've written about it, I call it the root of least resistance. There's other <laughs> ways to get there, but that's the root of least resistance. And so I decided one of the first things I had to check off was I needed a teaching experience at a major uh, public research university. So off I went to Rutgers. Because of the great education I got from the faculty here, uh, and because there were only <coughs> two teaching positions open that year nationally in counselor education, I got hired by Rutgers to teach in the counseling psych department and also to be assistant, uh, assistant director of career planning and placement in the counseling center. So that was a nice hybrid. And then again, again, unleashing entrepreneurism, we needed paraprofessionals. Guess what the dissertation was just on? So build a group of a thousand paraprofessionals working all of the Rutgers campuses. Uh, and that was something that carried on. So that was a model where doctoral students supervise masters, masters, undergraduates, and we developed the model that way, and that worked out well. And so then in going to the University of Cincinnati, um, Ohio State came after me, Cincinnati came after me, and Cincinnati was the, the university of choice because they were the most entrepreneurial. They basically said, if you'll come to us, we'll build your own research lab, you can be head of the program, you'll be associate professor with tenure, uh, you will have an administrative sabbatical and an academic sabbatical guaranteed, 
and by the way, Warren Bennis is president. Uh, Warren Bennis is a very significant name internationally in, in the, the uh, leadership area. So went there and then Warren, as a mentor, unleashed opportunities in the Organizational Behavior Teaching Society for me. Along that way, they had also guaranteed me some postdoctoral work in Tavistock group process. So they sent me to England for that training in addition, which was wonderful. That's played a big role. So then at that point, um, I'm wrapping up very quickly now, students. At that point, um, the question was, do I become a president? Because I was a VP for student affairs at that point and a full professor uh, promoted from within. Or do I become a provost and then a president or whatever? But women were not getting jobs as presidents except at very troubled institutions, with the exception of Hannah Gray at the University of Chicago. So the first troubled institution that came along that I uh, had an interest in was Longwood College. Uh, it is now Longwood University. We had two years to turn it around. Actually, they gave me three years. We did it in two. To turn it around, merge it with Virginia State, or close it. And it is uh, a, a university where four alpha chapters originated from in the sororities. It is a university that has taught probably every student coming through a school in Virginia has been taught by a Longwood grad. Mm -hmm. So again, that was another major culture shift at that institution because they were better than they believed they were. And then we had to build on top of that. And then the second presidency was another major turnaround where it was either close it or turn it around quickly, but with heavy duty union trouble in addition. So that was another type of, of opportunity. And then you might say, well, why search? Well, this is where it comes full circle students. One of my doctoral students at Rutgers graduated and started her own search firm. And she's been a friend of mine forever since then. And she said, well, you should go into search. You know group process, you know leadership development, you know career development, you know higher ed. This, you can do all this, but it brings everything together. So I said, well, why not? <laughs> and about that time, Hydric and Struggles, which was a leading global firm in the corporate world, came after me to be a consultant with them as a VP and a partner and a director. So I went with them. Uh, that led then to starting my own firm, and I decided to start that with Betty Asher, who had been a doctoral student of mine at Cincinnati, full circle, students. So look carefully at your faculty, you never know <laughs> when they may come back around to you. Um, but working with her off and on since the 70s, and in 80, 90, oh, what was it? I guess it was uh, 93. No, it was 2000, 2003. We decided we'd start our own firm. A week after telling my firm I was leaving to start my own firm, I was diagnosed with cancer. So then, as you can imagine, all the healthcare questions, what if, and all this stuff. Um, and Betty and I, Betty Asher, and I decided we were going to go forward anyway. So we went forward. All clients stayed with me. We continued the journey. Every year we've grown the business. Uh, every year we've increased the profile of repeat clients. We've worked as far away as Japan and Hong Kong and Australia. Uh, we've done worldwide work. And we now are the largest higher ed search firm dedicated to higher ed in the industry globally. And we have people working all over the country, but a major presence in the Metro DC area, and of course, located in Destin, Florida. So that brings us full circle. So let me